Hey guys, thanks for checking out Quick Sessions Podcast. My name is Garrett Terrio, and today I'd like to talk about a documentary that I just watched on Netflix. It is called West Side Barbell Club, or it's called West Side vs. the World, but it's about the West Side Barbell Club. And if you don't know what that is, you may have heard it, you may have seen the shirts. In the powerlifting community, it's a very popular gym. It is maybe not the birthplace of powerlifting, but they might tell you as much. But anyway, it's on the west side of Columbus, Ohio. It was started by this guy named Louis Simmons. So back in the day, 60s or so, maybe early 70s, Louis Simmons was a big time power lifter and world quality, world class. And he just lifted tons of weights. He had a whole garage gym set up, came one of the strongest men in the world, and then broke his back. And it was at that point, after he broke his back, that he did a couple things. He invented the reverse hyperextension machine, or he's credited with it anyway, which you may not have it in your gym. It's in a lot of old school gyms because it's a big piece of equipment. But think of it like a Roman chair. You put your feet in and, you know, you bend down, bend back up. It works your lower back. Well, think of that, except imagine your upper body is laying on something and your legs are the things that raise up and down. So that's one big thing that he invented because it was the 70s and fixing a broken back was not, the medicine had not quite caught up to those injuries. So at that point, he started doing a ton of coaching and he created the West Side Barbell Club. It was in his garage and it was just dirt floor, big weights. You know, they talk in there about the story of where the hundreds, the hundred pound plates were welded onto the bar. So you couldn't even come in there unless you could do 245. And it was great. He found all these big time lifters and they competed and they broke world rec- world records and all that kind of stuff. And eventually he had to grow and he opened up a facility in some strip mall. As it goes, it's a commercial gym, but in the back he still had his meat and potatoes power lifting area. And once again, he coached and all that. He's not lifting quite yet, but he does eventually come out of retirement. But I'll get to that in a second. So anyway, what made him so unique is he would we didn't have the internet like we do today and back in the day the soviets were the ones who were on the cutting edge of physical fitness you've heard about the great track and field teams the soviets had back in their 30s 40s 50s and it's because they dedicated so much science to it so what this guy did louis simmons is he bought every piece of soviet literature he could on training i guess someone was translating it back in the day and he would go in he'd buy the books and from that he created something called the conjugate method and essentially what it is it's not too different from how power lifters lift today and it doesn't sound like rocket science but actually going with it and following this method was something that was not necessarily practiced at this time in society so it was definitely a risk but what it was is it combined essentially you would have days where it's just max effort right you're always trying to lift the heaviest amount of weight possible almost like you're maxing out every day whether you're maxing out your sets of three, your one rep max, whatever it was, you're doing the most weight the most times possible throughout a workout. Now, he's alternated that with dynamic lifting days where you did higher volume, but you worked with speed. So the idea is getting all your power on one day, all your speed on another day, along with your isolation exercises and all that, so that you can be strong and fast. You had to lift fast to be the strongest lifter. And it sounds like nothing because we've grown up knowing that force is generated mass times acceleration, right? We all know that the faster you move something, the more powerful it is. And lifting something fast is much easier than lifting something slow. So he took this method, this conjugate method, and recruited just the biggest guys, got them in the gym, and hardly even charged them a membership fee. This guy was definitely not, you wouldn't call him big time businessman. But he had guy like he had the first thousand pound squatter, I think, if I remember right. And just these huge three hundred plus pound guys that would come in and lift. And he's bouncing around facilities. He even opened, eventually got to the point where he didn't even have membership, but he just had a spot and he would only invite certain people to work out there. And it was the type of, you were part of a team if you were invited and you accepted. So it's almost like you were a powerlifting team professionally. And what's so crazy about that to me, I'll veer off from talking about the documentary for a second, but I do not have a ton of experience as being part of a powerlifting team. I know plenty of guys that have, but on this level, we're talking about missing, you know, important things. You know, you're not going on vacation. You have three workouts in the morning, 
every week. Uh, if you're part of the night group, you had it three times a week, and that's that's it. Like, there's no, you're not going to your kids' baseball games. You're not going to family reunions if they're on a Friday or weddings or anything like that. It's almost like a football practice, except these are grown men who have their other jobs. And what's so impressive about that to me is this isn't a sport. This powerlifting is not something where you're going to make a ton of money. You're not going to get a lot of notoriety. Sure, you'll be in the record books if you become that successful, but it's not something that comes with a lot of reward. So it's looked at as this kind of grimy, hard-nosed, extremely passionate sport. And this passion, you'll see in the documentary, definitely spills over emotionally. These guys are, are fighting each other. They are all trying to be the alpha male amongst several alpha men, right? These are the, the biggest, strongest guys in the world. And it's at a time where there's really not much for them to actually showcase, right? You have your meets and all that back then, but now you have stuff like strong men, right? To where you can showcase your power a little bit more. Not to mention you have the Olympics. Now these guys are, are powerlifting, they're not Olympic lifting, but some guys could definitely translate to the Olympic lifts if they needed to. And there were just so many strong guys gravitating to this one gym in Columbus, Ohio. Not LA, not Houston, not New York, Columbus, Ohio. So many, in fact, that at the world powerlifting competitions, which is Every nation gets a team, and you score six lifters for each nation. Westside Barbell Club could have won the world championship with just the members from their gym. That's how dominant this one gym was. And even Louis Simmons himself, he came out of retirement when he was 50 to compete in Masters to you know walk the walk once again. And he bench pressed 600. He's the oldest guy to squat 900. Just crazy stuff. Crazy strong. And if you're watching this documentary, you're watching these guys lift, it is just painful. The injuries are through the roof. Just looks awful. So on the rise to fame and powerlifting in general, but especially at Westside Barbell, and I'm mentioning them as for a reason you'll see in a second, is once Marathon came out with these bench press suits or squat suits, you've seen them there. You see guys get buckled in before they attempt a record or anything. And it's, it helps you get the weight up. It's so tight. The clothing's so tight that you almost have to, if it's the weight's light enough, you got to pull the weight down to hit your chest. And that's really what made powerlifting take off, right? That's when everybody started joining places like Westside and plenty of other powerlifting gyms all over. But what's funny is nowadays powerlifting meets are going more raw is what they call it. And that's just when you don't have gear. I think you can still have a belt, but you can't wear squat suits or bench press shirts or anything like that. And they never really answered it in the documentary, but for some reason, Westside Barbell didn't want to do that. And there's no reason they wouldn't be just as strong as the guys raw, you know what I mean, with or without a suit, because those guys are also not wearing bench press shirts and squat suits now. So I don't exactly know why. I need to dig a little deeper into that one. But anyway, Westside Barbell Club, Columbus, Ohio, they have the strongest man in the world as far as total lifts, which is your bench, deadlift, squat, all the weights combined. I think it's something like he got over 3,000 pounds, something completely insane. So that's a big, you know, prideful spot for Louis Simmons and Westside Barbell Club. So now I've told you about the documentary, there's kind of some parts of it that I would like to personally talk about. And this is definitely just my opinion on the whole thing and my observation of watching this documentary. I'm not sure if this is the point they were trying to get across. But like I mentioned earlier, this is a sport where there's not really any money involved. There's no real fame involved. It's strictly a passion sport. The problem is doing these type of activities lead to injuries. They lead to your body completely breaking down by the time you're, you know, 30 something. The lifespan is so short. Or on the other hand, if you are one of these guys that can break records, there's so many stories of guys just getting burnt out. And with something that is so intense in an environment like Westside Barbell or any other powerlifting gym, where the atmosphere is so intense, these guys almost don't know how to live without it. It's not PTSD or anything like that, but there's so many stories of people turning to drugs or, well, drugs is the main one, right? Or just people not knowing how to live with themselves once that is over, whether they chose to leave or not, that it almost has a lot of tragic surroundings. So now here they are, beat up, old, their family life probably isn't great because they've sacrificed everything to be a part of this Westside Barbell Club, this powerlifting team. I mean, they got guys sleeping in their cars, coming from other places in the nation just to become a big time powerlifter. And even Louis Simmons himself is probably the most tragic because he's 70 something years old and he's 
such an egomaniac, he's not even going to pass on his gym to anybody. He's just going to shut it down because I guess no one else is worthy of running Westside and that destroyed some relationships for him. But there's plenty of examples of, you know, guys there that OD'd on drugs or committed suicide or anything like that. It, it just mentally sounds like such an unnecessary lifestyle for something that doesn't have much reward. Like, I understand being passionate about something, but there's a million things to be passionate about. And you can continue to be the biggest, strongest guy at the gym. Maybe not Westside Barbell Club, but even then they go in knowing they're only going to be the strongest for a short period of time. There's always someone bigger and stronger coming up. So the the whole documentary has an, an air of, I'm not going to say depression, but kind of a dark side to it. And you're looking at all these impressive feats of strength and there's almost no happy ending to any of it. There was like one guy where he seemed somewhat happy and it's because he left and just stopped body, stopped, uh, I'm sorry, not bodybuilding, powerlifting. And he said, yeah, I, I broke the world record and I was just burnt out. Just didn't really care much for it. And he even admitted it took him a while to readjust to not going there three days a week or five days a week or whatever it is to lift tons and tons of weight. And their bodies are broken down. And you know, by the time they're 40, they feel 70. And it's just miserable. So what I took away was just kind of sadness for the whole thing, regardless of how successful they were as a powerlifting team. And regardless of the identity it gave these people, everything just seemed to end once they broke that record or once they, you know, finished their time working out or whatever. It was just kind of it. They just they peaked and then everything else, nothing else can get them going. And that environment, yeah, Louis Simmons is 70 years old and still living it, but he has no friends, no family, can't stand the new generation with cell phones and all that. I don't know. Doesn't, uh, doesn't seem like an icon or a hero to me. Seems like a lesson of take a step back and chill out. Maybe don't alienate all your clients or friends or teammates or whatever you want to call them. All in the name of something that most people will never remember and never care about. But I guess to him, being the strongest or having the strongest guy at his gym for a moment in time is, is his thing. Not my life. But that's my thought on it. I think you should go check it out. There's tons of little intricacies I didn't really talk about. But I assume most people listening to this haven't seen it or may not even be interested in watching in two hours on powerlifting. But that's what I'm here for, to give you a short podcast to sum it up. Guys, thanks for checking it out. Hope you enjoyed it. I think you should go watch it. called West Side vs. The World on Netflix. Make sure to follow me on Quick Sessions Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Also, if you have not, subscribe, rate, and review in the Apple Pod Center. Google Play, Spotify, wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for checking it out, guys. I'll see you next time.